Good one. So this is, this is a complicated topic. First of all, because it's really complicated in itself. Uh, and I don't think that there are many people alive on planet Earth today who understand post-structuralism very well. Uh, I wrote my dissertation on Foucault, which means that I know some things, but in, in general, you know, post-structuralism is difficult. Uh, um, some, you know, partly for good reasons, partly for <laughs> much bad reasons, uh, which I'm not sure I'll have time to go into. Um, so post-structuralism is complicated, on the one hand. On the other hand, I am not an expert on international relations, which is, like, nobody's perfect, which, which is really element, you know, a lamentable fact. So uh, uh, for me, this class is going to be uh, fairly challenging, and I hope that you will help me, because, again, like, I'm responsible for the post structure side, for the international relations side, I hope, again, you, you'll fill in the gaps. Um, well, mm, start. Uh, let's 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 start um, with the broad definitions. So uh, post-structuralists don't like labels. So most of the important post-structuralists actually never called themselves either post-structuralists or post-modernists. And uh, in many circles, post-modernism is just supposed to be like a, a term of abuse. Um, uh, to some extent, unfortunately, deservedly. Uh, if you want to, if you want to read a horrible example of uh, um, post-structuralism at its worst, there's a text by uh, George. In your home assignment, it's really horrifyingly bad. Mm -hmm. um, it technically, it wasn't the home assignment, but it's the official recommended. Uh, yeah, official, official recommended reading. Uh, uh, and maybe, maybe I'll have a chance to talk about that in in in, in a second. Um, so, um, so, so anyway, so in terms of terminology, first of all, uh, you can use post-structuralism, post-modernism uh, interchangeably um, for the purposes of this class. But keeping in mind that none of the people, or well, few of the people we are talking about, actually use the term themselves. Um, so immediately there's a problem uh, because uh, um, structuralism is sorry post-structuralism is, is related to structuralism and you haven't, which you haven't studied, uh, uh, and also it is broadly speaking similar, quite similar to both uh, constructivism and critical theory. There, there's there's similarities between uh, um, um, uh, post-structuralism on the one hand and constructivism and critical theory on the other. So much so that it may be difficult to exactly tell where the difference lies. Um, and uh, so I was thinking about this actually over the uh, over the over the break in ten minutes I had, and this is this is this is the um, this is the example I, I, I came up with. So um, post structuralism is much more interested in power than constructivism, and is much more maybe pessimistic than constructivism. And so in, in in this sense, in this sense, it is much closer to Marxism or critical theory than structuralism. If you if you compare just these three, of course they're obviously much more similar to each other than all the other theories. Um, like uh, the, the the phrase I came up with in my mind is this: that post-structuralism is a pessimistic, superstructure-centered, so uh, centered on superstructure and culture. So uh, pessimistic, superstructure-centered, centered, intersectional Marxism. So it's like, uh, uh, I mean, many of the people who are talking about like Foucault and Derrida were actually Marxists early in their days. Uh, 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 and, and, and Marxism is, has played an important role for them, although all of them rejected Marxism for various reasons. But so they are, they're much more pessimistic. Uh, maybe I should write this on the board. So uh, somewhere, um, let's, let's, say, let's say here. So it is more pessimistic than Marxism. In the sense that Marxism or critical theory believes in this uh, progress, hope, or, or at least universal moral values, uh, uh, whereas construction doesn't, and uh, it's oriented on the superstructure. And this is actually going to be one of the one of the criticisms that post-structures pay far too much attention to culture and not enough to objective material conditions. This is going to be a crit critique of post-structures, including critique of post-structures in international relations. That they talk too much about language, culture, and narrative, and they forget. That uh, in international relations, you know, material forces, objective forces also play a role. So uh, pessimistic, superstructure centered, uh, um, and when we say superstructure centered, also, uh, or maybe let's we'll say pessimistic, pessimistic in terms of values, but pessimistic also in terms of values in the sense that we're not moving towards progress, or ne not necessarily moving towards progress. And secondly, pessimistic in terms of uh, uh, objectivity, that uh, post structures do not really believe in objectivity all that much. Like th this is a very problematic term for them. Like. Of course, you cannot prove that objectivity doesn't exist, but they would, they would allege that uh, all the time, or most of the time, when people use the word objectivity, they're simply trying to masquerade or mask their bias as something you know, naturally true. Uh, uh, whereas, again, Marxists tend to talk about objective material conditions. Post-structure is known. So, again, so pessimistic, centered on the superstructure or language or culture. Language or culture. Um, and then intersectional. So, intersectional in the sense that, um, you might have heard this word before, <laughs> 
uh, intersectionalism is the notion that, uh, uh, sort of post-Marxist notion, that the struggles in society aren't just about the, the bourgeois and the proletariat, they aren't just based on class, but there are also, class, uh, there are also issues of gender, race, ethnicity, sexuality, you know, all, all sorts of other cultural markers. And the word intersectionality is used uh, um, because sort of the idea that the, 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 uh, the, the, the dominated group, the dominated group is actually formed on the intersection of being, first of all, bourgeois, secondly, female, thirdly, black, fourthly, I don't know, queer, some of the, and at the same time. Um, like how, how these um, structures of domination intersect along various axes. And this is immediately, by the way, this is immediately an important criticism of post-structuralism broadly conceived, because not all post-structuralists, I think, make this mistake. Well, <laughs> let's say mistake. Uh, not, not all open to, the same, uh, to this criticism to the same extent is because when you talk about intersectionality, uh, Mar classical Marxists uh, would say that you dilute the most important question, which is the question of class, and when you dilute that, you lose the struggle immediately. Uh, we talked about this actually last year, you remember when we discussed Karl Marx, that, that for, for Marx, you know, all issues of, of, uh, of uh, gender, race, ethnicity, whatever, sexuality, these are, these are important issues for Marx as well, he's for freedom, but Marx is going to say you should not try to solve them before you solve the biggest problem which is sustains the moral capitalism. And so we have to unite all our forces along the same front, which is the front of uh, a class struggle. Um, Anyway, so uh, pessimistic, superstructural, intersectional Marxism at the end of the day, because yes, I, I, you know, like it, it's it's not 100% Marxism, but it is as close to Marxism as you can get in this course, or maybe more close to culture. Uh, sorry, critical theory, critical theory. So not not Marxism, but like, but with these presuppositions, it's like critical theory, and in all of these ways, it is different, although it is similar, but different from constructivism. Okay, okay, okay. I hope this is something to start us off. Um, yeah, by the way, maybe I should have mentioned in the beginning. So uh, there are no University of London questions which center entirely on post-structuralism. There are questions which uh, sort so of deal with it more tangentially. I think uh, the better students should be able to write a couple of good sentences about post-structuralism. The best I would, be, uh, I would expect uh, to write like two good paragraphs. So this is our yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I will perhaps make some interjections when something which yeah, is so, 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 for answering your So the, the excellent students should, students should be able to write two paragraphs about this, but everybody can write one sentence. Let's try, let's try to see what the sentence is. Uh, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me try. Um, to give the conclusion in the beginning, because why not? And ho hopefully you had the lecture and you had the home assignment, so you have some background. And again, I will ask you to come in at some point. I will not talk. For, for, for the entirety of class, hopefully. Um, so it's like this. Um, first of all, language plays an important role. So post-structuralism is about language, first and foremost. And language is not a neutral medium for expressing thoughts. It's not a neutral instrument. We're talking about international relations. So language in international <laughs> relations. But instead, language, especially when certain linguistic constructions talk about <coughs> progress, nature, inevitability, Mm -hmm. How something leads to progress, something is natural, something is inevitable. In fact, what this language does, does is it, uh, 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 so, so, sorry, sorry, go, we'll go back a step. So some describing, by describing something as progressive, natural, ine inevitable, and therefore legitimate, progressive, natural, inevitable, and therefore legitimate, in fact, in fact, these language games, they mask arbitrary assumptions arbitrary assumptions. So they pose something arbitrary as if it is natural, inevitable, and therefore legitimate. Um, and these arbitrary assumptions often could uh, be basically vehicles of power. So in this sense, they, they uh, you know, cons like post-structures in IR, they see stories which, uh, uh, which are told as if there's progress, even though there's no progress. Something is natural, even though it's not natural. Something is inevitable, even though it's not inevitable. And therefore legitimate, even though it's not legitimate, but actually serves the interests of certain particular groups. Again, language is a vehicle of power in this sense. Okay, this is maybe not the best way of phrasing this, but as a, be as a beginning, as, a, as our first class. And then towards the end of class, hopefully we'll, we'll have a, a, a maybe a, a, a better sentence. Okay, so um, if we want to try to... Um, I don't know. Well, again, I'm going to attempt it to pause and let you ask questions, but on the other hand, I feel that maybe we should push forward because if you have some questions now, hopefully I'll answer most of them uh, uh, in a second. So, 
um, if we want to talk about post-structuralism, and again, so post-structuralism, post-modernism, these are strange words. We're going to use them interchangeably, even though, again, most important philosophers never apply these terms to themselves. Um, uh, they are, the, the roots of post-structuralism are, broadly speaking, two. Structural, well, maybe more, okay, but I'm going to focus on two. This is always a debatable question. I'm sure every textbook has its own genealogy. So one is structural linguistics of people like Ferdinand de, de Saussure. Um, and the second one is, broadly speaking, structural sociology. And when I say structural sociology, so I don't, I'm not sure if I want to write this on the board. Maybe I should. Um, So yeah, so uh, um, structural, structural linguistics and uh, structural sociology. So and when I say structural sociology, I mean structural anthropology of people like we, uh, sorry, uh, Claude Levi Strauss. So structural anthropology of Claude Levi Strauss. You don't need to remember this for the example because again, remember two paragraphs. Uh, but this is for your general understanding because in order to write two, two clever paragraphs, you need to have a deeper understanding. Uh, um, and also very importantly, Marxism. I'm sure others as well. I mean, I can talk about Hegel. Hegel has a huge influence on the post-structuralist movement, but you know, we don't have time to talk about everything. So at least, at least these two. Um, and uh, what unites what unites both these approaches is um, a certain um, disposition, um, which is which broadly speaking can be called anti-humanist, anti-humanist disposition, anti-humanism. Now, what we mean by anti-humanism is the following notion that um, uh, uh, in the past, especially in classical theorists. Um, used to uh, take human agency very seriously. That human beings are either free, like ontologically free, ontologically instead of like, really have free will, and human beings really, through their freedom, shape the course of events. Uh -huh. mm. This would be one approach. Or another approach would be uh, in people like Thomas Hobbes, for example. Hobbes would say, no, human beings do not have free will, but human beings have preferences, and these preferences exist objectively. Uh, uh, and so it is still human freedom, although human beings are not ontologically free, yet they are free to pursue their interests, which motivate them. But still, the driving force behind politics used to be, or behind human you know, history, was seen to be um, human agency, human agency. So, freedom understood in some, phase, in some form. So what structural linguistics and, and structural sociology does is it tries to explain that away. So anti-humanism in the sense that not that we uh, hate humans or something, no, that's not what it means. Anti-humanism means that we do not believe that humans are uh, masters of themselves or that humans have agency. In, in, instead, we see humans as products of larger forces of uh, cultural evolution, of history, something like that. Uh, this goes back a long way. This goes back to Jean-Baptiste Vico, uh, anti-humanism, and this goes back to you know, people like Hegel, uh, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel with his notion of Geist and how human, human individual consciousness is a product of this Geist formation. Which broadly, I mean, uh, um, the, the preferred term for this type of thing in post-structuralist uh, language is discourse. Discourse. It's not that human beings are sort of autonomous subjects. No, human beings are shaped by discourse. What is discourse? First pass to oversimplify culture. Human beings are shaped by culture. It's not that we... Uh, act, it is culture shapes us in a certain way so that we act in a certain predictable way, which is pre-programmed by culture, if you want. And especially structural linguistics has this notion that it's not that human beings speak a language. In some important sense, a language speaks through the human beings. Uh -huh. And, and uh, we are just passive nodes. Uh, you know, in, in, some, in some very direct way. You know, I'm standing here in front of the board. Is this my agency? Post structures would say no. This is my physical body simply reproducing all of those signs which I have heard before. It's not really me speaking. It is a language, cultural context speaking through me. So uh, all of these I ideas I have in my head, they come from texts, they come from teachers, but there's like in some sense they're not really real. They are, um, or, or, they, or, or these ideas do not hook on to reality in any straightforward fashion. What I'm doing is I am retelling a story. As if, as if I was telling you a fairy tale, or as if this was like a um, theater play, and I learned my role by heart, and I'm, I'm, I'm telling the role to you. But I am not the author of my role. I am not the author of my role. Huh? But who is the author? Well, ultimately, post structures would say, uh, nobody's the author. Discourse, the power of power is anonymous and impersonal. Culture, culture, which is some kind of emergent property of human beings, 
uh, interacting with each other. Of course, culture is hard to study. You cannot isolate it in a test tube, but we will understand what, what we mean by this, hopefully, you know, this structuralist approach, which is, again, again, you, you see something similar in Marx. Marx has this notion of ideology. Uh, so again, so structural linguistics, structural um, um, sociology. Yeah, uh, so, and immediately let me signal this. There's a, a bit of a confusion, I think, uh, um, mm, mm. In post-structuralist literature, because different post-structuralists use this differently, some people still, with Foucault, insist that power is anonymous, it doesn't really belong to anyone, and other post-structuralists would, would uh, always talk about interest groups, interest groups. So it's like, these are two very different modes of talking. One mode would say, look, there's the con contemporary American discourse, which has produced people like Donald Trump. Donald Trump has no agency. He's simply reproducing, he's simply retranslating, tra retranslating, right? Uh, uh, the discourse, which has been... Uh, uh, in, uh, implanted into his head, which is incidentally why popular culture is very important for post-structuralists. Post-structuralists, because popular culture shapes the way people think, shapes the taken for granted assumptions. Assumptions which are not explained, but simply taken for granted. Uh -huh. Go back to Nietzsche. Truth is lie which has simply been repeated enough times. So it's not like you know that uh, for sure you've done like a 100% experiment that uh, um, uh, international relations is a sphere of anarchy. No, actually it's post would say it's not true. You don't have this access to truth with capital T about international relations. But certain um, sources, certain texts, and certain people have repeated this word enough times such that we simply take it for granted without really paying much attention to it. We simply, you know, sort of, that, that, that's, that's the way it must be. So again, uh, let me go back to what I was trying to say. So um, one approach would be anonymous and structural, saying that Donald Trump is simply, uh, like language is talking through Donald Trump, a certain kind of culture is talking through him, he has himself, he has no agency, this would be one approach. Or another approach, which you, which you see often kind of confused in the same, sometimes even in the same sense, is that no, what actually happens is you have pressure groups, interest groups, like uh, white, you know, middle class, or maybe rich male, or you know, top 1% of America. And mm, these, are, these, these are different, these are different. Because if you talk about interests, then you, uh, um, then you, what's the right phrase, you reify, you uh, use the word agency. You, you, you mean agency seriously. No, actually Donald Trump, what he's doing is he's consciously or unconsciously lying in protection of his class or gender or whatever interests. This is one view. And another view, no, this is all completely structural. We don't have interests because the interests themselves are, are constructed uh, uh, by culture. And again, we sort of talked about this a little bit. Uh, last year, when we talked about people like uh, Rousseau or maybe Hegel, Rousseau has this phrase, perfectibility, you, some of you will remember, again, this notion that <laughs> human beings by themselves do not have preferences. We do not know what to like, we do not know what to want before society teaches us what to like, what to want, what to value, what to esteem. And in, in this sense, there are, there will be no objective interests. So I don't know, like, uh, let, me, let me write this on the board somewhere. Do we have objective interests? Uh, 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 and, and the question is kind of both yes and no. And for, for somebody like Michel Foucault, the answer is clearly no, there are no objective interests, all this is structural. But when, for example, Campbell, Campbell writes the history of the Iraq war, Campbell uh, talks about how George W. Bush uh, um, presents a certain narrative of the uh, United States as uh, civilized and orderly and progressive, whereas uh, Iraq is this uh, barbaric, uncivilized, and horrible. But again, you, you, you kind of cannot, cannot really have it both ways. It's kind of, either language speaks through you or you have objective interest and kind of tends to be conflated. But, but the, no, that's okay, I suppose. Um, so, yeah. So this is, this is, this is basically the, the background. And if, again, if we, if we um, you know, if, if I was writing your textbook, I would say that this is the most important, anti-humanism is the most important thing about post-structuralism, except that certain post-structuralists, when they say, oh, the white males are to blame, they stop being anti-humanist and they reify white males and say, no, they have interest and they have, they make certain discourse. And that's kind of, a, I, I feel this is kind of is a Is the word anti-humanism actually mentioned in either BSO? No, I think not, I think not. Uh, <laughs> mm. Yeah, they, they use the word structuralism. Okay, yeah. but this is this is the, the way I, I would explain. Okay, so okay, so maybe maybe let's erase the word anti-humanism and just yeah, because uh, students struggle a lot with this structure agency problem, and mm -hmm. yeah, I guess post-structuralism is a good uh, mm -hmm. um, well, structuralism is par excellence anti-agency, and post-structuralism is mm -hmm. very much in the yeah. same vein. So I suppose um, what I want to do next is I want to get into the into the gist of the argument. Uh, let me start with some um, basic uh, terms and presuppositions. Let's talk about the role of ontological and epistemological assumptions. 
and what, it, what, what we mean by anti-financialism and anti post positivism and especially this difference between causal and constitutive theories. And, and then, when we lay the groundwork, we will exemplify them through these um, terms, discourse, deconstruction, genealogy, and intertextuality that we see in the text. So, mm, let me start um, somewhere. So, again, I said, like, our, our beacon, our battle objective for this seminar is to explain what, what do we mean by saying that language is not a neutral medium, but a vehicle of power. Language is not a neutral medium, but a vehicle of power. Um, Um, so, one thing, um, one way to start talking about this is uh, in terms of ontological and epistemological assumptions. So, ontology, hopefully you will remember, ontology is a philosophical discipline which studies being, what exists. Uh, uh, and epistemology is a philosophical discipline which, which studies the question of how do we know what we know. And as far as I understand, you will talk about this later in the course, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, so, and um, most of the time, when, the when theorists do theory, they do not question their assumptions. They just take certain things for granted. And uh, immediately, um, post-structures are going to say, your reasoning can be fine, but if your assumptions are value-laden, if your assumptions are uh, um, laden with power relations, then your conclusions will also be laden with power relations. So, uh, ontological assumptions. When we talk about social theory, maybe one of the most crucial ontological assumptions is whether we live in conflict or consensus world. Like, is social reality essentially conflictual, or is it uh, uh, so like self-help and competition? Or are we talking about uh, social reality as essentially being cooperative? So, uh, you, in a straight, very straightforward fashion, this applies to the international sphere, right? So, um, um, to take first an example which is closer to my area of discipline, uh, uh, for somebody like um, Karl Marx, uh, at least up until the time we reach communism, uh, Social society is a seat of struggle, this constant class struggle between the rich and the poor, well, the, the, those who control the means of production and those who work. Or, for somebody like Nietzsche or maybe Callicles, there's this notion that human interests are, could essentially be at odds with one another, and you can never have consensual politics, that politics has an irreducibly conflictual element. Carl Schmitt, who is mentioned in one of your readings, actually says the same thing, that the essence of the political is the fact that you have irreducible conflict, irreducible conflict. This would be one type of one particular example of ontological assumptions. Uh, an alternative example of ontological assumptions would be, take Aristotle. Aristotle says, man is by nature a political animal, zone political We are naturally social. So we are naturally enabled by our society. You know, so you can look at um, uh, Aristotle, or you can look at Hegel, maybe, to some extent. Because, uh, uh, again, Hegel, in his notions of uh, <laughs> positive and negative freedom, uh, moral subjectivity and ethical membership, this notion that you can only be a human being through society, that society does not so much restrict your freedom but enables your freedom. If you know anything about Durkheim, Durkheim would also be, Emil Durkheim would also be an example of uh, uh, consensus, consensus uh, uh, ontology. So again, in international relations, this translates, I think, very uh, directly. Please correct me if I'm wrong, so you have the neo-realist perspective, which says no, there's an uh, uh, irreducible anarchy uh, in the international sphere, and uh, states always will engage in self-help, and morality has no place. Uh, uh, like, if, if you engage in quote-unquote moral behavior, you're simply harming yourself and harming your subjects, and so in an important sense, you are being immoral, if you are being moral for, for, for uh, uh, neo-realists. Whereas the liberals, the neoliberals, would probably say that there are objective uh, moral values, and there is uh, a, a substantial space for consensus. Mm -hmm. And these would be two different assumptions. And theorists working in each theory, within, within each framework, do not tend to not question these assumptions. And um, uh, so, to finish this example, so, um, so post-structuralists would come in and they would say, hmm, is it really the case? Like, let's, let's, let's examine your assumptions. Let's, just, let's not take them for granted. Let's examine them. Well, you say that uh, international arena is a state of irreducible conflict. Is that really true? Or is it maybe in your interest? Is it maybe in the interest of a particular policymaker to present the international arena as a, as a sphere of conflict? Mm, to take an example which is slightly different uh, um, during the Cold War or after September 9-11 uh, attacks or 9-11 attacks, uh, the government of the United States used the rhetoric of international conflict in order to push through certain very unpopular legislation at home. Mm -hmm. and so post-structures would say, ah, but your assumptions, they're value-laden. 
they're, they're arbitrary. You don't know that uh, you, you, cannot, you cannot prove to me that international arena is necessarily the seat of conflict. First of all, you cannot prove. And secondly, you taking the stance, you are taking it not because you have evidence for the stance, but actually because it is in your narrow self-interest. Yeah, that's extremely uh, similar to Robert Cox's thing. That the theory is always for someone and for something. <laughs> so this would be an example of ontological assumptions. Likewise, when we talk about epistemological assumptions, um, similar notion, uh, post structures would say that there's no such thing as a brute fact. Um, well, like, if you want to be really pedantic about this, you can go back to Kant and say that uh, the act of seeing is not a neutral act, that by seeing we always already interpret, that there is no uh, possibility, there's no God's eye view, there's no view from nowhere on reality. We always already interpret, through at least through the prism of our senses. This is what Kant would say. And later theorists, Kant was talking about things which he thought were universal to all sentient beings, but theorists after Kant, starting with Hegel, will talk about, if you, so Kant has categories, you can talk about cultural categories, how cultural categories influence your perception of the world. Um, um, and um, so there's no, there's, there's no such thing as brute fact. There's always already value-laden or power-laden interpretation of a given phenomenon. So, uh, like, it, it's, okay, something happens in uh, the Darfur province of Sudan. Something happens. Well, first of all, already to say that something happens, that's already an interpretation. Because uh, a Martian can flow by and say, no, nothing happens there. It's just, uh, you know, or, or at least it's nothing different from what happens in, in, another, in, another, in another place. So, yeah, if, if, to already say whether something is happening or not, that's already a description. That's already, that's already a non-neutral description. Uh -huh. Evaluating description, saying, let's calling attention to it, saying maybe something should be done about it. And then saying, it's a tribal war, that's one description. Saying it's genocide, it's another description. To say it's either a tribal war or a genocide is a third description. So you can, you can never approach the brute fact itself. I mean, there, there are always, if you want, there are always assumptions which are not value neutral. Um, I'm not sure I should give this example, but maybe, 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 you know, I'm not sure if this is going to clarify, but let, let me give it very quickly. So if you have a thermometer, you could say, well, that's objective. No, it's not objective. Because there are so many theoretical assumptions behind the act of, let's imagine there's a thermometer sticking you know, outside a window. There are so many theoretical assumptions I bring to bear when I read the thermometer that I understand the numbers on the thermometer. I know what's a Celsius scale. That uh, um, this thermometer is operating under normal conditions, that the pressure, because you, you understand, this is, you know, uh, a thermometer working outside, outside of its normal pressure limit will show a different temperature. Or let's say, if, 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 the, if, the, uh, if the temperature is too low the therm or, or too high, the thermometer can give a, um, a different reading. So, so even, even this simple, innocent fact of reading temperature is impossible, uh, both structures would say, without bringing assumptions. Now, a thermometer is kind of hard to say what are the value-laden assumptions behind it, but, you know, there are, maybe, but let's not talk about that. But obviously, when we talk about social reality, ex you know, uh, talking about things such as, I don't know, marriage or genocide or killing or whatever, having children, all of these things are never, never uh, value-neutral. And again, again, um, um, Bailey Smith uh, gives these examples. Okay, so a, a person dies. Is this a, a murder? Is this uh, a righteous vengeance? Is this uh, uh, justice? Or maybe this is divine retribution? Who knows? Uh, and, you know, we look at the thermometer and we say, oh, this is very clear. Or we, we look at coronavirus and we say, yes, it's objective that there's coronavirus. And people like Foucault would remind us that people in the Middle Ages also thought that there, there was objectively such a thing as witches and demons. And, and, you know, the same way that we quarantine people, you know, some people were burned at the stake. And we think that we are right and we have correct justification for that. Well, guess what? People in the Middle Ages also thought that they were right and they also had correct justification. So, anyway, and since, in some sense, uh, we can never get to objective reality, and this is anti-foundational and post-positivism, since we can never get down to objective reality, uh, we have to examine the views, if you want, for their consequences, for their consequences. So because the question of truth is unavailable to us, we ask the question, in whose interest is this? What does this lead to? Uh, and immediately, let me jump straight into the fray, this causal and constitutive. Um, so you have this democratic peace theory. Democratic peace theory, hopefully you've heard about this before. Again, this notion that the more democratic you are, the more peaceful you are. Well, uh, uh, and let's, let's run a regression with a statistical analysis and, and say, is this true or not? And um, um, post structures will come in and say, that's an invalid procedure. Because what, do, what counts as a democracy? What counts as acts of aggression? Uh -huh. So uh, United States uh, bombing uh, Serbia. Uh, some people will say, oh, that's, no, that's not aggression. That's a humanitarian intervention. Uh, um, you know, uh, and some people say no. That's is an act of aggression. There's a, a, a huge 
you know, America has the largest prison population in the world. Is that acts of aggression or not? That's another issue that international relations, uh, sorry, post-structures talk about. They uh, uh, um, challenge this um, perspective, this um, framework of sovereign states. And sometimes they want to go beneath the lid, the black box of the sovereign state, and ask, how does the state treat its citizens? What, uh, marginalized groups or prison population. Okay, the United States uh, uh, does not wage aggressive wars, but you know, uh, millions of people are in, are in jail working for below minimum wage uh, uh, for, for basically victimless crimes like marijuana, which probably should be, should be legalized anyway. And the fact that it's, the reason that it's not legalized is maybe because the United States government wants these people in prison because they can work for less than minimum wage. Okay, I, it's a complicated story. But. Just a quick note to support uh -huh. this theory, uh, like we can forgive uh, Alexander slightly. It's, it's not that uh, you are uh, more peaceful the more democratic you are, but rather that democracies do not go to war with other democracies. Uh, well, of, of course, ideas that democracy brings more peace also are present, but it's just not called democracy. Apologies, apologies, but thank you, thank yeah, you. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. So, so again, so cause of, to 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 finish finish with this. So, uh, constructors would say that causal analysis. In an important respect, like it cannot be done. Because when, like, maybe it would be nice to do causal analysis, but it's just it's it's it's, it's impossible. Because when you define uh, a, a democracy or when you define uh, aggression, that's that's a, that's already a value uh, laden judgment. And so, rather than talking about these statistical correlations, um, for example, like um, what explains the level of piracy in different African states? Is it economic? Uh, deprivation or military capabilities. So instead of asking this question, post structures want to ask a different question. Which activities are seen as piracy, what, labeled as piracy? Why are they labeled as piracy? And what does such labeling legitimate? What do these narratives, like, so we say this is piracy, this is not piracy, we give a certain criterion. What, what actions does this criterion legitimate? Mm -hmm. So we, we're sort of asking for the dirty secret. We, we sort of, we presuppose, this is, oh, by the way, this is pedantic among you, this is called hermeneutics of suspicion. Hermeneutics of suspicion. Hermeneutics means, you know, t textual interpretation. Suspicious interpretation. You always interpret a text thinking that the text is a dirty secret, that in fact, the author does not say what he means, but actually what he means is to, he tries to, yeah, again, like Robert Cox, trying to advance a particular agenda, and we're trying to uncover this agenda. <laughs> of course, I suppose we can add another criticism to the uh, 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 post -structure, critique of post structuralism and we'll talk about this towards the end of class, is that um, uh, can, you, can you apply the uh, same, same thing, so self-referential self problem? So if everybody is lying, the liar's paradox, are post structures themselves lying? If every, if every statement comes from a particular perspective, does this theory come from a particular perspective? And which perspective that is? And does that invalidate it? Okay, okay, okay. So um, hopefully, hopefully this is more or less clear. So how much time do we have? A lot, a lot of time. We're doing good, we're doing good. Um, yeah, so let me try to talk briefly about uh, the four main concepts. I'm going, I'm, I'm, I'm I, I want to, I want to, I want to get to the dialogue stage of this seminar, but I'm afraid that sort of we're going to get bugged down into details. And of course, no, no, de de definitely, we should talk, but you know, a, a bit later, a bit later. But the, the, the smartest person in the room should talk, that's okay. Uh, unless he has a broken jaw. So. <laughs> okay, okay, that's, that's also a discourse. Yeah. Which, uh, natural, <laughs> inevitable, legitimate, progressive. Yeah, yeah. What, is, what does this legitimize? Anyway. Like, uh, what do we mean when we say the smartest person? Okay, yes, 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 a constitutive pose. So anyway, so we have these four, uh, phrases: discourse, deconstruction, genealogy, and intertextu intertextuality. Uh, let's start with the word um, deconstruction. Actually, well, I don't know. Well, no. Let's start with the word discourse. So we talked about discourse already briefly. Again, this notion that human beings are not agents, but culture speaks through us. Or alternatively, that language is not a neutral medium, but language is always, uh, um, you know, laden laden with power. And um, Oh, I mean, this is this is this term is due to Michel Foucault. I kind of I don't want to go into details, but sort of just to mention a couple things. Um, Foucault stresses this relationship between knowledge and power. How um, again? Imagine um, a um, colonial struggle. So so Britain colonizes India. Britain uses its power to extract information about India, which in turn this information allows Britain to control India more efficiently. But this is on the surface. But more importantly, 
It is the British who will write books about India and educate Indians, like Gandhi will be educated in British institutions and will look at India through the British lens. And this allows, again, in some sense, power to first constitute knowledge, but then knowledge to reinforce structures of power and to implant certain ideas into the, minds of, into the mind of Gandhi, you know, influence, for example, his way of reading Bhagavad Gita, because, you know, from the standpoint of, uh, you know, uh, classical sense mythology, uh, Gandhi has very little to do with Bhagavad Gita. His reading of Bhagavad Gita maybe is uh, quasi-Christian, Augustinian, uh, Rousseauian, but not Indian, but not Hindu. Anyway. Um, and, and does this have consequences? Does this have consequences in international relations? And the answer is yes. Um, so more to be said about this. More to be said about this. But I don't want to. I don't want to. I, I want to. You know, get through this as fast as possible. So again, so discourse, if you want, uh, is a certain narrative. Is a certain way of presenting facts. Is always a non-neutral description, and you can never get beyond this non-neutral description. And this, the way you uh, 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 describe things, influences the way people behave. Um, genealogy. Okay, this can be hopefully phrased in very simple terms. So genealogy is a term basically due to Nietzsche, and Nietzsche contrasts genealogy with history. You can probably take this if you want. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, uh, a genealogy can be contrasted with what history. So and uh, history for Nietzsche was something like uh, uh, progressive, something that was supposed to explain uh, how you know historical events are not just random violence, you know, random violence, one, one event following another, but actually there's a structure and logic, and it's going somewhere, uh -huh. it's like history with a capital H, uh, for, um, for Nietzsche. And genealogy, he contrasted with this, uh, uh, because, you know, I mean, if you think of a genealogical tree, if you look carefully at the genealogical tree, it's full of contingencies, it's full of randomness. I mean, the reason I have, we have the genealogical tree that we have is due to so many, you know, a huge number of contingent events. You know, this person met that person, they, you know, uh, got together, that kind of thing. You know, so it's like, genealogies are always messy. They're always problematic. There's nothing inevitable that these two people would meet and form a family. So genealogy seeks to uncover, so sort of uh, seeks to uncover these presuppositions, seeks to portray history not as necessary and progressive, but as contingent and power laden. Not as necessary and progressive, but as contingent and power laden. Contingent means unnecessary, if you want. Yeah. But, yeah. but it, could, it could be different. It could be, and this is, this is in some sense, this is the ultimate option of all post-structure theorists, that things could be different. That we, we, we all these specific uh, does this with regards to the state, state centricity of IR? Yeah, state centricity of IR. We regard mm, mm, state centricity, sovereignty, as inevitable. But states are the, the, the only possible actors. But but actually, actually, this is just this is just the kind of story that we have been telling to ourselves, which is not necessarily true. But simply because you know, uh, truth is a lie, which has been repeated enough times. You know, this is very similar to critical theory, if you remember. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Obviously, obviously, there are. I, I, mean, I mean, this distinction between post structuralism and critical theory is really quite artificial. Yeah, because, you know, Foucault, for example, was a big admirer of uh, Adorno and Horkheimer, so it's like. Yeah, yeah. Where, where, where do you draw the lines? Where do you draw post structuralism the lines? definitely is critical theory, like small c critical. And post structuralism, post -structuralism is also clearly small c constructivist. Uh, uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, hopefully, you understand this phrase small c versus capital C. Um, yeah. So. So again, so discourse, genealogy, I hope this is more or less clear. Uh, so intertextuality, again, in very simple terms, is the idea that um, context is important. And if you look at and things like uh, the Charter of United Nations or um, some kind of text of political philosophy, like, I don't know, Hobbes' Leviathan, these texts, they do not hook onto reality in any straightforward fashion. But what they hook onto, what they refer to, what they stand on, the way they ground themselves is by referring to other texts. So texts are not grounded in reality. Texts are grounded in other texts. And again, this same idea that <laughs> truth is lie repeated enough times. You know, that certain things get repeated over and over and over again, and we just take them as taken for granted or something. Yeah, okay, in the international sphere, there's anarchy. That's natural. We don't, we don't, we don't have to discuss that. Certain uh, contingent, arbitrary assumptions are taken as universal and necessary. Um, okay, so the, the, the most problematic phrase of all this is deconstruction. So to oversimplify, to oversimplify, mm, uh, what, uh, this, is, this is due to Jacques Derrida. And Jacques Derrida is a notoriously difficult philosopher, but you know, the basic idea is simple. Uh, Derrida wants to say that any text is uh, necessarily polysemic. Well, okay, I know. So different ways to explain this. Okay, let's, let, 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 me start, let me start from afar. Derrida has this uh, interesting word, which is uh, a combination of two words in French. It's called difference. difference. 
like this. So it's like a difference with, with, with an A. And it's supposed to mean two things at the same time. It's supposed to mean difference and deferral. Difference and deferral. Uh, and this is supposed to be an explanation of how words mean. So first, of, first thing that Derrida says, this is due to Saussure, structural linguistics. Uh, Saussure understood that if you want to be really scientific about this, because you see, I cannot crack open your skull and see the meaning in your head. So the only way I can actually talk about the meaning of science is with reference to other signs. So uh, Saussure would say that there is nothing to a meaning of a sign or a meaning of a word in addition to its place in the structure of all other words. So to oversimplify, marker simply means not a table, not a chair, not a horse, not a person, not a verb. What, what, you understand, huh? So, but this is difference. So in some sense, the meaning of the word is, is pure difference. Pure, purely because it's different from other other sides. And again, so structuralism and post-structuralism, structuralists tended to think of this um, structure as like more rigid and more orderly and operating according to set rules and transforming according to set rules. And post-structuralism is more about introducing dynamism into the structuralist picture. But as uh, um, uh, Ferguson, Ian Ferguson told, told you in, in the lecture, actually post-structuralism has much more in common with structuralism than with other theories. So again, even though, even though they're supposed to be contrasted, Post-structuralism is not anti-structuralism. They mostly appropriate the elements, just introduce nuance. So this is a di dynamic version of structural, structuralism, if you want. So again, so first, first idea is difference. First idea is difference. But second idea is deferral. So deferral means delay, delay. So the meaning of the sign is always delay. So if you ask me, what is a marker? And I open uh, 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 the, the, the dictionary, what do I get? Do I get meaning? No, I get more, more sign, I get more words. The meaning of a sign is just more signs. And if you look up the meanings of those signs, you get even more signs, and more signs, and more signs. And up until infinity, or actually not infinity, but the, the circle becomes closed at some point. So it's a circular, circular. The meaning is deferred forever because the, close, the, 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 the circle is closed uh, uh, at the end of the day. Again, imagine a nagging child who asks some stupid question, know, or, or not a stupid question, like, what is a marker? I say, well, it's a marker is something you write on the whiteboard. What is a whiteboard? Well, whiteboard is something you use in university. What is a university? University is education. What is education? And just keep asking this forever. Obviously, there's never a place where this has to stop. I mean, you can get annoyed and bored and stop it forcefully, but strictly speaking, it never stops. So you have difference and deferral, difference and deferral, and both of them expose that in some sense, the, 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 the problem of, of meaning, that in some sense, Texts do not mean anything, because their meaning is just pure difference and, and it's always deferred up to infinity. Which in Derrida means that in principle you can make the text mean whatever you want. You can make the text, you can read the text in any fashion that you want. This is sometimes uh, associated with the phrase, death of the author, death of the author, smerts um, after. And uh, Derrida wants to say that actually people are aware of this possibility. So we have this, what he calls a logocentrism, uh, in the sense that um, what we are always trying to do is we're trying to suppress meaning. So meaning has a tendency to proliferate. The text can mean whatever. And, and like any text, if you read it carefully enough, opens itself to these uh, arbitrary assumptions and undermines <laughs> itself, if you want. But what we are trying to do is we're trying to suppress the possibilities of language. We're saying, no, it means just this one thing and nothing more. And yes, it hooks onto reality. And, but, but these are magic words, magic spells, because I can say that... that uh, 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 the text hooks onto reality, but actually what it hooks onto is just another story. So yeah, again, same thing with the thermometer. How do I, you know, the, the, the temperature in some sense is also uh, like a story, a text and interpretation. Mm, let's take a different example. So uh, how do we know that there are um, Big Bang? Well, you say, I've looked through a telescope, but what you see through the telescope is also kind of narrative. I mean, okay, you see some blotches uh, of light, but and, and before these blotches are, are verbalized and written out as an article in a scientific journal, they don't mean anything. So um, again, uh, uh, um, so my throat is a bit uh, coarse for French pronunciation, but uh, Derrida has this very famous statement. Mm. <coughs> uh, Il n'y a pas d'or text. Il n'y a pas d'or text. There's nothing outside the text. So uh, me meaning that, again, in some sense, uh, uh, we have no uh, um, direct access to objective reality as it exists, or brute facts, but it's always mediated through a description, very importantly, through a linguistic description, which is always fraught with arbitrary assumptions and power-laden structures, that kind of thing. Um, so, and so, so this is difference, and by, uh, if you want, like, if you understand difference, you can use it to deconstruct any text, to uncover, uncover the suppositions. And these, these four ideas are actually very similar. And um, what your study guide says is that um, uh, Derrida tries to deconstruct the dominant systems of meaning, 
within specific disciplines, let's say international relations, and the ways in, the, in which those structures can be uh, destabilized in order to ed indicate other possibilities for theorizing. So destabilize the official dogma, the taking for granted assumption, destabilize them, undermine them in order to think differently. Again, to take a very simple example, undermine the state-centric view of international relations in order to find other possibilities for theorizing, for theorizing, but also other possibilities for action. Because I, I think that uh, um, justice critical theory, uh, post-structuralism is also very much action-oriented, like policy-oriented. Like This is not just descriptive, this is also to some extent normative and pres prescriptive. Um, so, um, yeah, so just, just to like mop this up, so there's all, also very important questions of identity. How do you describe yourself, who you are personally? Or like United States describing itself in the times of the Cold War through this opposition that we're United States, we're not the Soviet Union, we're anti-communist. Com uh, Soviet Russia describing itself as anti-capitalist, or 9-11, again, this notion, this binary opposition, uh, uh, me versus the enemy, uh, us, civilized white versus the enemy, or another example that they give in the uh, BSO is uh, uh, Turkey. Can Turkey, can Muslim Turkey be admi admitted into white, civilized Europe, white, civilized, progressive Europe, uh, Christian, Christian Europe also. Uh, um, so again, so these questions of identity become important, and again, very important that identity is narratively constituted. People do not there is, there is no objective description of what people are. When you describe people, you imbue, you imbue, imbue them, you um, impart to them a certain identity, and therefore you influence their behavior. So uh, another example, I kept talking about this here, inside, outside, all sorts of these binary oppositions, inside, outside, order, chaos, uh, uh, barbaric, civilized, uh, um, us versus them, capitalism versus communism, uh, uh, civilization versus terrorism, uh, Christianity versus Islam, you know, or, or, or secularism versus Islam, something like that. Um, and again, so ultimately, again, uh, anarchy, sovereignty, yeah, anarchy, anarchy, sovereignty, very important. Yeah, so anarchy, sovereignty, like anarchy is always necessarily disorder. Sovereignty is necessarily order, and you cannot have order on, outside of sovereignty. Those kinds of presuppositions. Um, and ultimately, the point is that human beings are not born subjects. Again, this is this is the anti-humanism part. They're, they're not born subjects, but they are, they are created with with uh, with certain. Um, like, if you want, by culture or by discourse, people are created with certain subject positions. Uh, uh, so you, again, nobody is a policeman in and of themselves. It is a culture that imbues certain people with police power. Likewise, nobody is a Muslim in and of itself, or, 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 or a Christian, or, or, or a woman, or a man, or, uh, I don't know, or, or a child. But all of these things are narratively constituted. None of these terms are innocent. All of these terms carry certain connotations. You are... A woman, therefore you are. You are a child, therefore you are. And again, ultimately, again, this, this point, this Whig view of history, trying to present things as pro both for neorealists and for uh, neoliberals as progressive, natural, inevitable, and therefore ultimately legitimate. Yeah? Children are uh, naturally um, unintelligent, therefore it is legitimate for parents to decide for their children. Or, you know, likewise, uh, I don't know, uh, homosexuals, uh, this is going to be biopower, uh, homosexuals naturally uh, uh, engage in promiscuous intercourse, therefore they spread AIDS, therefore it's legitimate to curb their rights. So, uh, again, uh, biopower would be one example, one, one term I have on the board, that Foucault talks about uh, this notion of, uh, of how, and again, you see, you see here the moving away from a state-centric approach, uh, uh, trying to unpack the black box of the state, if you want, to dig deep and, 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 and sort of um, see, also problematize, in context of international relations, problematize the relations between states and its citizens, state and its subjects, or state and aliens who reside on its territory, you know, state and the people who, who live in its territory or in other territories which the state affects. Um, and, um, yeah, so and biopower, biopower for Foucault, this is, um, this is the most important uh, I, I, I suppose phrase, biopower is a certain kind of discourse, Foucault calls it the governmentality, so again, a combination of two, two words, government and mentality, so a certain way of understanding what the government is and a certain way of looking at things from a government perspective, which emerges basically in the 20th century, I'm not, not exactly sure where, but, you know, uh, well, is it 20? Well, it, 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 it starts to emerge with what uh, he calls politicized Wissenschaft, with the uh, uh, emerge, and actually Hegel talks about this, with the emergence of the police, state, police, po politicized Wissenschaft, science of the polis, science of the city. So, um, biopower is treating population as a resource. So, when you, uh, you know, firefighting, social welfare, 
um, social health care, uh, public health care, <laughs> vaccination, all these kinds of things. When government begins to take care of population as if it was a resource. And, and some people, you know, the new realists would say, yeah, but this is obviously in people's interest. And uh, post-structures like Foucault would say, no, this is not in people's interest. This is, uh, again, logically of maybe efficiency for efficiency's sake. You want to take care of the population, not because it's good for the population or because it's going to make the population happy, but because you want the population to be efficient. Um, mm -hmm. What's this? Economic capabilities in international relations. So this, yeah. is, uh, this notion of bio power, and mm -hmm. I guess Foucault's conception of power in general, mm -hmm. uh, is perhaps one of the rare occasions where uh, it is uh, a concept which we talk about in this class is closely tied to the actual questions of the University of London. Exam. So for example, in the University of London question, how is power best in the student's national relations? Exam comments do make a reference to post structures that you may talk about post structures and mm -hmm. their uh, theories of power because they say a lot about power. Yeah, I wonder if more people will decide to write about post structuralism on one exam after this class. More or less people. <laughs> yeah, 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 more. more. <laughs> anyway, so, um, uh, um, yeah, so to, to sort of wrap this up with biopower, again, in some important sense, Foucault was going to say, would, would say that, see, this question of happiness, is the population happy? That's, that's, a, that's an effect of power. You construct the individuals such as, as, as such as so that they describe themselves as happy. But if people say, oh, yes, I'm a happy American, it doesn't mean that they're actually happy. It's just a, a sort of the way that the social system works. And, and you want them to attach to those descriptions, yes, I am happy. You want, to, to to, you want them to attach to it certain characteristics that you want. Okay, this, this sounds like a conspiracy theory. That's sort of uh, some kind of uh, um, behind the curtain. In the White House, people plan to reshape the uh, minds of the citizens. And, you know, to some extent, maybe this does take place through, you know, p political technologies. But for Foucault, ultimately, this is a, this is a uh, structural anonymous process, and everybody is subject to it, including people at the top. Uh, I'm not sure, do you, do you even talk about panopticon, all that kind of thing? Well, at least, at least one sense. Again, Foucault has this notion that especially modern power, as, as uh, compared to medieval power, is um, it's anonymous, it's spread out, it's spread out, and especially exercised through surveillance, constant surveillance. Everybody observes everybody else and makes sure that we conform. And again, to see, to see norm normalcy as pro progressive natural inevitable and delinquency as legitimately punished, and when, you, when you're being punished, to see yourself as legitimately guilty, again, which is similar to Robert Cox's coercion in the Middle Ages, and now this hegemony, this notion that people understand. Yeah. Perhaps, yeah. like, we're not interested in the exact mechanisms that mm. Foucault provides mm. when he explains his concept of power, but what we're interested in is his conclusion, which is that mm. in one society, power is used to shape, mold, like, create individual subjects, who are endowed with specific values, aspirations, identities, goals. This is that which is important for yeah. IR. Because when, when for example, in, uh, in constructions you talk about identities, you can mention that post structuralists look at the exact mechanism, you know, for example, Foucault with his discipline of power, how are those identities constructed? Mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. And, exactly, and you can see this link this back immediately to causal and constitutive theories. Does economic progress cause people's happiness? And Foucault was going to say, but what constitutes human happiness? Why do people describe themselves as happy? Why do people who are, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, morbidly obese and depressed and have been an on antidepressants for the past 20 years describe themselves as happy and happily vote for Donald Trump? Why do they do that? Is that because they're really happy? Or is it because you have this uh, non-neutral non description of language? Again, in some sense, I, well, should I? I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, there, there are ways. Psycho psychologists know these ways through which people can tell a certain story about themselves, which has nothing to do with reality of what, what their psychological life is. Uh, uh, um, okay, 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 okay. Well, actually, as a matter of fact, yeah, okay, let me, let me, while I'm still uh, in control of my own <laughs> language, let me, let me finish by talking, um, and then hopefully we'll have a discussion. Let me finish by talking about strengths and weaknesses of, the, uh, of this approach. So, um, the strength, the strengths that uh, um, your BLD textbook talks about uh, is first, first of all, that um, post-structuralism offers this genealogy of power in international relations. That it, it asks, you know, asks these deeper questions about basic ontological and epistemological assumptions. So, um, trying to bring to the fore, again, so most, most theories would say, oh, it's just natural that uh, states have power in international relations are, are the center. Well, actually, no. Let's uncover this. Let's ask, 
How did it come about after the Treaty of Westphalia that uh, states acquired this relation? And at the same time, uncover that things can be different. So why things are the way they are contingently? And how can things be different? Mm -hmm. So, well, actually, the second one, yeah. incidentally, I already talked about, yeah, yeah. is that post-structuring challenges state centricity, which I just explained a second ago. And the third one is that uh, post-structuring offers a positive project on the level of non-state actors. Although, although we have to be careful because, in general, post-structuring tends to be rather pessimistic. If any of you, just for fun, want to watch, it's a very famous uh, uh, debate between Noam Chomsky, you might have heard, and Michel Foucault. And you, you, can, you can see the full force of pessimism, of uh, post-structuralism in this debate. And, um, you know, all these magic words that Noam Chomsky uses, like progress, nat people are naturally cooperative, we're naturally going to lead to progress, all that kind of thing. And, and Foucault is just like, come on, these are just magic spells. Okay, uh, uh, so, so, but, but still, but still, you, by opening other possibilities, you, you open also this possibility, and time will tell. Uh, anyway, uh, so these, 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 these are the positive sides. Okay, the criticism, the criticisms of uh, post structures perspective. So the first one, and this is from Bailey Smith, the first one is that uh, postmodernism or post structuralism is actually incomprehensible. Like the you, and, and either, either, behind this incomprehensibility, either, it's meaningless or trivial. It's like so it's a charge that what they actually, what the post structures are actually doing, is they're saying something either which is meaningless or false or trivial, and they masquerade it behind this high floating language, which is difficult to understand. If you want to read an example of this, there's a wonderful example in your home assignment. This is this chapter eight. From George. Yeah, it's, it's actually not the, the, the coma side. Yeah, yeah, okay, this is, is the official recommended further reading. Official uh, recommended further reading. This uh, chapter 8. So uh, basically, you know, I'm just going to use the last sentence. He says this uh, um, In this exciting and new dangerous spaces that are now opening up, postmodernism is the most exciting and least dangerous way of understanding and participating in the changing world. Okay? This is, this is a wonderful example of postmodernism gone wrong. Because what this text does is it takes a very, what's, right, what's, the, what's the word I'm looking for? A very banal, a commonplace liberal agenda, really like nauseatingly banal, bourgeois liberal agenda, and masquerades it as if, oh, it's something post structuralist You know, and I mean, post structuralist challenge uh, um, discourses and uh, least dangerous option. Why is it that you cha challenge the discourse of state sovereignty for the sake of sort of this community of humanity and not challenge state sovereignty for some kind of, you know, uh, fascist uh, utopia, uh, you know, uh, thousand Reich or something like that? You know, post structure opens possibilities. Some of them may, may be liberal, some of them may be, I don't know, fascist or totalitarian or whatever. I mean, we, 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 we tend to think, oh, you know, fascism bad, but isn't, isn't this, isn't this also just... Uh, and uh, taking for granted assumption, isn't this also just this binary opposition, sort of uh, fascism, liberalism? So this text is bad, okay? And, 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 and many post-structuralists are very rightly criticized for smuggling their particular values, in this case liberal values, through the back door, even at the, at the same time trying to criticize other theories. So, and, and ultimately this is trivial, this is completely trivial, this is simply neoliberal. Uh, maybe this is exactly why Ian didn't assign this. Yeah. Or, uh, maybe not. Or, 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 or maybe you just read it and you find that it's meaningless. That's also a possibility. So um, the second challenge, and we talked about this a little bit already, is that um, um, especially Marxists or crit you know, th critical theorists, Marxists would accuse post-structuralists of ignoring the material condition. And behind all this wonderful intersectionality, forgetting that there are real material interests and stake and uh, sort of behind all this talk about language and what constitutes, uh, you know, uh, th this or that thing, uh, uh, I don't know, philosophers like Stephen, Stephen Lukes would say, no, there is objective human misery, and we objectively have to, uh, have to rectify it. Of course, post-structures would disagree, many, uh, uh, but, but this, this, is, this is a potential criticism. But again, by focusing too much on language, too much on signs, uh, post structures forget that there's a material reality, objective, maybe, yes, maybe objective material reality on the other side, as critical theorists would say, let's say, objective material reality of domination and uh, uh, misery. And in fact, many people would say that postmodernism, again, um, was Frederick Jameson, one of the most important Marxists of 
today has actually written a book, Postmodernism, the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism, where this is basically his argument, that basically uh, uh, post, what postmodernism is, is this new fluffy way of saying, oh, uh, everything is a text and nothing is clear, uh, sort of, uh, in, or in order to uh, uh, um, arrive at a very conservative conclusion. Because if nothing is clear, you shouldn't do anything. Okay, you're going to help the, help the poor or you're going to help the, pro the proletariat. How do you know that you're actually helping the proletariat and not just bringing about some kind of new structure of power? Uh-huh, 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 mm -hmm. so, so this would be the criticism, and again, and, and the counter-criticism would be, no, you Marxist, you are just building under the pretext of a new uh, utopia, you are, you are building a totalitarian state, so kind of, the, 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 the road goes both ways. Uh, um, but it's, again, I think it's a productive dialogue, because, you know, in, in an important sense, both sides have something important to say to the other side. Um, like, if everything is a text... Uh, what, what can we do? But on the, on the other hand, yes, if, if we're talking about uh, mis alleviating human misery, how do we know that we are not simply, again, in this genealogical fashion, uh, uh, attributing to something progressive, natural, inevitable, legitimate, simply something that serves our interest? Although, although again, the Marxists return the favor. They will say postmodernism serves the interest of big capital today because they block, they, through this intersectionality, they block uh, real effect effective struggle. They, they stop working class from uniting. Um, so, criticism number three is that uh, post-structuralism does not offer causal explanations. And uh, if you think that's a criticism and some theories do, then post-structuralism fails as a theory. And, and these people would say that unless you offer causal analysis, you are simply not in the business of, of doing theory. Yeah, if you recall, it's exactly the same thing which we said about constructivism. When we said constructivism is less of a theory and more of an approach, precisely because it is not causal. Yeah, and Chris, so these these are these are from uh, Bailey Smith, and the last one is from me. So let me let me write it it's in double quotes. It's the problem of self referentiality because if at the end of the day we believe that everything is power, and uh, there's no such thing as truth, there's no such thing as objective no, 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 reality. This is, uh, this is very relevant. For example, there is one question which says that a critical theory, uh, like ultimately, amounts to nothing more than uh, speculative nihilism. This is exactly which you are expected to talk about if you go into post-structuralism. Oh, okay, yeah, exactly. This is very much relevant. Yeah. So, again, yeah, so like, like, if everything is a lie, is this sentence everything is a lie? Is it a lie or not? And this sounds like a silly paradox when you, when you say it in terms of one sentence, but when serious theorists say, no, actually, this whole history of, uh, this, whole, this whole canon of a Western political philosophy, like people like you know, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, all of them are, are simply, they're not saying things which are true, but simply you know, masking their uh, class interest or their racial interest or their uh, gender interest. Uh, th the same question can be asked of these theorists. How do you know that your uh, um, um, theories do not mask some kind of interest? Derrida says that every text explodes, but can his text explode also? Can you deconstruct? There does text, and, and and if you do indeed, 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 a uh, very nice phrase. What was it? Speculative nihilism? Something like this, yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, let's let, let the word nihilism. Yeah. How do you stop this from being? You know, because it seems that in order to not be a nihilist, you have to commit yourself to at least one value and say, yes, this is objectively uh, uh, suffering. This is objectively common interest. Yes, we should objectively act. Because if you for, if you prohibit yourself from saying those things, then you end up saying nothing and doing nothing. Okay, 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 okay. Anything else important I need to mention? Okay, there's um, uh, um, <laughs> names in the home assignment, but um, maybe you will fill in the gaps. So, so, all the important things. Am I forgetting anything? I think you just will. Thank you very much for this high uh, So, one sentence. Uh, this is not going to be clear, but let's, let's, let's try. So this one sentence that everybody can write has to be something like this. That language is not a neutral instrument, but language uh, well, not is... Not necessarily language, but also a kind of discourse. But, uh, it's fine. Yeah, but discourse is constituted through language. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, so, 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 yeah, so like, 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 mm. both structures is not exactly 100% language sense. It's just that probably more understandable to say language than not mm. discourse. Yeah. Okay, so language of international relations theories. Language of international relations theories is not a neutral instrument. But it is laden with, uh, 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 with assumptions which can be arbitrary or power laden. Laden, laden. It's fraught with assumptions. 
which which can be arbitrary, which may turn out to be arbitrary or power laden. Serving interest. Yeah, and, 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 and by depicting it as something that's progressive, natural, inevitable, in fact, it just serves to legitimate a, a particular sectional interest. And that's it. I hope this was fun. I hope this was more or less clear. Uh, uh, questions, problems, discussion. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a huge chunk of the seminar that you were responsible for us to explain these guys to me. There's, a, there's, a, there's another name. So we have Campbell, Delarian, Michael J. Shapiro. There's also Ashley, I think. Walker. Uh, Ashley, I'm Walker. Uh, Ash, like, uh, screw Ashley, maybe just for Walker. Because Ashley also uh, figures as a critical theorist. So as to uh, not break their brains by, by saying, that, oh, he's simultaneously for the first person critical theorist. Ashley. Sorry, Walker. So, questions, problems? Was this fun? Did you miss me? <laughs> At least something good came out of me breaking my jaw. <laughs> I have like a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so, one would be like, I think it seems to me that there is like a very significant difference between critical theory and uh, uh, post-structuralism in, in that critical theory uh, has a very strong normative element. Uh, mm -hmm. Both Winklater and Cox, for example, would say that uh, there is like a clearly identifiable groups, uh, dominant groups, and uh, a very uh, clear positive project of uh, emancipation. Uh, but uh, I think as you mentioned in relation to maybe part of the whole post-structuralism mm -hmm. like, tradition, uh, mm -hmm. they genuinely are skeptical about uh, potential for, for this emancipation yes. because uh, no emancipation is possible because it will reinforce, uh, not, not reinforce, but recreate other forms of discrimination, right? Well, I wouldn't say it necessarily would, but you can never know. You, you're always, any project of liberation is at risk of being another ideology which simply, a different, like, masking a different form of determination. Huh? Any liberation could potentially masquerade as a different form of determination. So it's not that it's impossible, because how can you prove an impossibility? But it's like, they're always suspicious. They're always, the post structures are always suspicious of this. Um, and what about their methodology? So they criticize the positivist methodology of like causality? Mm -hmm. uh, would, like, do they have... Uh... Uh, okay, but in terms of methodology, post positive critique of empirical claims, yeah, the trouble is post postulism is defined in the negative. It's a term... Well, no, but we, we, we understand what post structures are doing. They are doing discourse analysis. They are trying to stay within the limits of language and use the resources of language to undermine language itself. They're trying to use like a... Like language is a can opener to open itself up. Using language, deconstruct language. Some of that. Which, which I mean, you can do. Yeah, actually, you know what, I, I, I'm, look, I'm looking at slides by uh, Ian, and he actually says, despite all the claims of deconstruction and opening up IR, there is a conservative element to some post-structuralist research. So, nihilism, or also this conservatism. Because, again, if, if everything is equally power, it might as well not change anything. Okay, people, well. thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. It was, was, was nice, it was nice talking to you.